Well, after listening to that wonderful presentation by the professors and my senior brothers here, I wonder what the, I'm going to say again. Let me start by thanking Pastor Poju for what you're doing. Ordinarily, this type of organization would have cost government millions to do. And that is part of what we're saying when Bismarck said we have to stop issue of conferences. I thank them, like I said before, my two senior brothers have spoken, and they are respected people, economists, wonderful people. So for, for me to come after them, when I'm not an economist, I'm just a trader. <laughs> I'll only just add because uh, I've had the opportunity of serving and be able to say, well, I thank Professor Saludo. He showed clearly that the problem is politics and showed how we can go. But for me, I was reading the Chinese ambassador's letter a few days ago. He said you have to look at where you are and be able to then say where you want to go. So for me really is that as Nigerians, as we look forward to what Professor Luda said that we should do, look at tomorrow, it is important that we look at where we are today as well. And what are we going to do with the people that are in Nigeria today and then from them we we'll lay the foundation of that tomorrow. Today Nigeria is a home to the highest number of poor people living in any nation on earth. If you look at the latest report of UNDP it says that Nigeria have moved from 86 million to 98 million persons living in extreme poverty. In fact, we are growing at 5% annually. Every minute, six Nigerians fall into poverty. Just a decade, a few years ago, China, with a population of 1.4 billion and India with a population of 1.3 billion had more people living in extreme poverty than Nigeria. By the year 2000, China had 500 million people living in extreme poverty. But by just adopting and strict implementation of Million development goals, they've been able to pull 439 million people out of poverty. Just in 2012, India had 276 million people living in extreme poverty. Today, they have less than 76. Nigeria now have more people living in poverty than these two big countries combined. And that is our crisis. And this can be collaborated when you look at our own HDI. If you look at the, the summation of human development is human development index. This is a measure of how a system is developing. And it's categorized into very high, high, medium, and low. And if you look at it today, Nigeria would have over 157 in position is among the low. And if you look at the critical components of it, there's three of them. One is life expectancy. The global life expectancy today is 75 years. Nigeria is 54. 20 something years below. In fact, Nigeria is the third lowest. It is very clear. The second is education. Nigeria today is home for the highest number 
of out of school children, 13.2 million. In fact, if you look at the words, the, from if the word the minister is saying is correct, it should be about 15 million. And if you look at it, of all the countries I'm going to use to share an example of where we are and what we want to do, which is countries that are within the BRICS nation and countries that are within the Mint nation, Nigeria is the only country where you have such a low literacy rate of 51%. All of them are on the average of over 90%. Nigeria is 51 and this is that because of our own gross lack of the impact of education, which is what the previous speakers were saying. Number three is per capita. Per capita, as the professors have mentioned, is a measure, is what you can call a measure of living because it's a, it's a measure of individual wealth of any country. Nigeria, unfortunately, is one of those countries where the per capita has been falling for years now. In the recent IMF report, it says Nigerian per capita will actually continue to decline until about 2025. So it's not stopping. You could see that in 2015, we were 2,500. Today, we are 1,920. This is about poverty. If you look at security, Nigeria is now the third most insecure place to live on the surface of the earth. We are now behind Afghanistan and Syria, and with daily killings, banditry, and kidnapping, it is being speculated that Nigeria will soon overtake them. Our underemployment and unemployment is one of the worst in the world. People will tell you it's about 25, it's actually over 30%. And with over 22 million pe young people in their productive age doing nothing, it is very worrisome. And of course, concomitant, with all these devices we are seeing today, whether it's banditry, whether it's masculine, kidnapping, and all sorts of things. These are what we are going through as a country. Our debt is collecting every day. If you recall on May 1, 2017, at this platform, I warned and cried about the debts we are piling. Because I was not an economist, because I had not had the opportunity of working in any of the Brentwood institutions, the then Minister for Finance said, no, that we are going to spend our way out of recession. Today, all the economies at the breadwood institutions ask, complain about our debt. We are now almost at 28 trillion, 90 billion dollars with little or nothing to show for it. What is even worse, the debt is a growing daily and consequently the service what we require to service it is worsening and i give you an example in 2017 we spent 1 trillion 630 billion dollars naira to service our debts in 2018 we spent 2 trillion 90 billion naira Within one year, it was 460 billion naira. 460 billion naira in 2018 was 90.3% our budget for education. And the same amount was 125%, 0.6, our budget for health, just to service debt. And we are still piling up more debts. It's still growing. There are some economists and some Nigerians or some people who say, oh, our debt, debt is not our problem, our debt to GDP is low, our debt to this is low. I don't think disagree entirely with them. Our debt to GDP is about 25%. It's low when you compare it to other developing nations whose GDP is actually in the region of 40, 50. 
But it's not about debt. It's what you use the money to do that is a crisis. Yes, you can say our debt is low, but when you have little or nothing to show for it, then you have a problem because you're borrowing for consumption. We have countries, when we said about countries that are wonderful today and good today, one of them everybody cites is Singapore. Singapore debt to GDP is over 100%. Over 100%, that's 115% of their GDP is their debt. But what is the difference? If you go and see Singapore, in Constitution of Singapore, it says you can only borrow debt for capital projects that will pay itself back. So all the debts they've borrowed over the years were invested. They're proper. They know where it is. Singapore today is building the biggest port under the sea that they will launch in 2050. That's where Soludo is saying we should go. So if they borrow money to do that, you go and borrow money for Shaku Shaku dance. You are finished. <laughs> so that is a crisis we face as a nation. Because of the way we are borrowing money and what we are doing with it, it is not impacting on our growth. We are one country that is borrowing money, it's not impacting on our growth. It's not a part of per capita. Nobody has seen it. We didn't see the bridges and everything that it was used to for. So our debt is worsening, and we need to do something about it. Today, we are the most stressful country. If you read the stress index, they said we are the most stressful. In fact, a doctor, a famous doctor in Lagos told me that he has found out that all his patients, once they arrive in Nigeria from overseas, their blood pressure goes up. And it's a record that he has. Our, if you come to inequality, Nigerian inequality today is the worst. 157 over 157. We're the worst when it comes, if you look at the Oxfam report. In America, 1% of the richest Americans control, that, control 37% of their wealth. In China, the richest 1% control 35% of their wealth. In Indonesia, which I'm going to use for example, they control 47. In Nigeria, the richest 1% control 85% of the wealth. And nobody is working hard. All other countries I mentioned are working hard to lower this. In Nigeria, it's even worsening. And nobody is talking about it. Forbes recently described us as money losing machine of Africa. Our stock market last year lost 18%. This year, it's lost 13%. Even when it's most shallow of all the countries I'm going to use, for example, within the BRICS country, no country where their stock market valuation is less than 200 billion, except Nigeria. If you look at all of them, Brazil is at almost a, a trillion. Russia is 575, India is 2 trillion, China is up 6 trillion, South Africa is $875 billion. And the second biggest economy, if you go to Mexico, it's 385, Indonesia is at 450, Nigeria is at, at 1 billion, and Turkey, the last nation, is at 200. So you have a crisis. Of course, you listen to what the recent, the recent seminar by the Sterling Bank, what the chief economist of World Bank said, he said we are living tragically on borrowed time. That's what he said about Nigeria. If you look at all this, you will see, like the previous speakers have said, we are living on a cliff. And we cannot continue with the present economic or political compass, whatever one you call it, which is not pointing in the right direction and would definitely lead to a collapse of this nation. And the earlier we do something, the better for everybody. For my little contribution, because previous speakers have mentioned a few of the things I want to mention, for my little contribution, I would dwell on just on three things 
and then conclude from there. For me, there are three things we need to deal with. And issues are number one, issue of security. Number two is issue of education. And number three is issue of the economy with emphasis in trying to solve our present under and unemployment. It is very critical. For security, I'm not going to make a lot of comments, but just to say that Nigeria needs to do something very quickly and drastically on our present security situation, which is questioning all our corporate existence. The great number one job of any government in any society is to provide security of life a property. If you cannot do that, then the government does not exist. And today, what Nigeria needs most is investment from local and from foreign direct investment. But nobody is going to invest in an unsecured place. No matter how profitable it is, the investor has to be alive to enjoy his profit. So there's no need preaching that, oh, it's 20% return, 30% return. I said it here before the platform. I lived in England for a number of years. And I had a partner, very good man. Very good man. I'm sure Professor Ludo is, knows him very well. Mr. Hardin. And he had a fixed deposit in a bank of about 5 million pounds. And I was the chairman of a bank. And I said to him that we're paying him 2%. So it was any hundred thousand pounds. And at that time, banks were giving interest of 20, 25 percent. And I went to him and said, Mr. Harden, since you said you're going to give them additional one million pounds, why don't you give it to me so that I can give you maybe 15 percent, more than they pay for this five? He said to me, okay, we'll go for dinner and talk about it. And he took me to dinner. And when we finished, he told me, Mr. Peter, let me tell you, Peace of mind is included in this 2%. You can keep your thoughts. <laughs> that he has planned his life. That he has planned his life on this 2%. He doesn't want the 15. I can keep the 15. <laughs> and that is the foreign investor you want to attract. Because he needs to have peace to enjoy his 1% and everything. And that's it. So it is critical that we know we need to provide security. The second thing I need to talk about is the issue of education. It's been repeated by previous speakers and everything is just to add. Every empirical studies have shown today that the more you can invest in education, the better your economy and society. Countries that are doing well today are countries that have invested and continue to invest in education. It's as simple as ABC. It's not something you need. So the more you invest in education, the education investment is not an expense. It is an investment. And if you look at all the countries I want to compare us with today, you could see it. Among all the BRICS and MINT countries, they all invest at least 4% of their GDP on education. Nigeria, tragically, our budget is low, yet our budget for education is even worse. If you look at all of them, if you talk about the BRICS, you talk about the Brazil, India, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And the mid nations are Mexico, Indonesia, Nigeria, and Turkey. Of all these nine countries, only Nigeria, one is that our budget is low, which is a discussion for another day. Only Nigeria is where you find the budget for education below 4%. It's a sorry state that is at below 1%. I'll give you an example. China. Today, with a population of 1.4 billion, their annual budget is 
Of course, there will be mentioned here that their GDP is about 13%, 13 trillion. Their annual budget is 3.8 trillion. Their budget for education is $590 billion. That's what China puts in education every year. More than 4% of their GDP, more than 15% of their budget. Consequently, for UNESCO, China has 95% literacy rate. The other country I'm going to use is Indonesia. Because of want of time, I want to use the best performing country in the BRICS and the best performing in the Mint. It's Indonesia. Indonesia is a country of 260 million people. Their budget is $178 billion, and they spend $40 billion on education. About 4% of their GDP, and over about 20% of their budget. Nigeria with 200 million people. Our budget is 28 billion, which is low. But even worse, our budget for education is $2 billion. It's a crisis. To even illustrate or explain it to you more, let me use a country closer home. It might not be a good example today, South Africa. South Africa, but we have to face the reality of where we find ourselves. South Africa is supposed to be the second biggest economy in Africa. The budget of South, annual budget of South Africa is four times our budget, and their budget is 110 billion, ours is 28. What is even worse, their budget for education is 17 billion dollars. In the past 10 years, Nigerian budget for education at the federal level is 4.4 trillion. If you change it today by 305, which is the exchange rate, it's 14.4 billion dollars. So a 10 years budget in education is not up to one year budget of South Africa in education. And that is where we find ourselves. So we have to face that reality and invest in this critical component. The consequence is that we have 13 million out of school children and everything. Everybody will say to you, where are you going to find money? Because that's what they always say when he says, where are you going to find money for, for education? My question is, tell me any of these countries, any other country in the world that pay what we pay for subsidy of fuel. Tell me any other country. And what is the impact of the subsidy on our economy? In the past 10 years, Nigeria, like I said before, has spent 4.4 trillion on education. If, let me even ask another critical component of development when you talk about life expectancy. You talk about health, primary health. Our budget for health in the past 10 years is 2.7 trillion. Both of them is just about 7 trillion combined. And that is what we budgeted in the past 10 years. In the same period, we must have spent, we spent about 10 trillion for subsidy. And I can tell you 75% to 80% of the money that is spent on subsidy is actually, let me not say what happened to the money, but all of you know. It can be better. It's a misappropriation. It can be removed. If this money was spent on education, and health, it would have, education would have received at least two and a half, two and a half times what was budgeted, the same thing for health. So instead of having about $15 billion for health, we would have had $37.5 billion. Instead of having $9 billion for health, we would have had 
So education would have had 37.5 and health would have had 22.5. Over that, and if that money was properly utilized, I can tell you it would have impacted better on our economy today, on our per capita today, and to the country. But that money wasn't invested. You can guess what happened to that money. Or even like people say, where are you going to find the money? Recently you saw the report that 1.6 trillion was stolen as an oil theft in 2006, 16. And in 2017, another one trillion was stolen. So if you combine these two, it is 2.6 trillion, which is the, in two years, which is the amount you budgeted for health in 10 years. So where are these thieves? Let's all of us go and look for them. <laughs> so these are the issues that I need to bring. That is where, so because people will say, where will you find the money? To go further, let me even talk about the issue of the economy. Let me leave education. I've told you that we can fund it, we can make it better. Let's look at the economy. With emphasis, like I said, on issue of underemployment and unemployment. Everybody knows that all various studies, and I'm happy that our famous economists here, nobody can talk about those brilliant economists we have in this country today without calling Professor Sukuma Soludo and people like Bismarck. They are among the best we have. And I'm sure they know that when you talk about the economy, you must talk about the issue of underemployment and unemployment. It is the greatest contributor to building a strong economy. If people don't have jobs, you have terrorism. You have banditry. You have all sorts of characters. If they remove any of us of here from having a job, we are, we are, different, we are different things. It's as simple as ABC. So you have to deal with that. And when you talk about the issue of employment of any nation today, whether it's China that we are celebrating, whether it's any other country within the BRICS nation or the mid nation, like I said before, I see you China and Indonesia to show an example. All of them, everybody knows that there's a direct connection between issue of employment creation, growth per capita, and growth of overall economy with your support, your support for micro, small, medium entrepreneur. Professor Gupta has said that Nigeria DNA is entrepreneurship. And I believe that. But that DNA is not being supported. What has happened is that we've abandoned this greatest engine of creation of labor and employment without any support. And if we want to solve that, it is not a sophisticated thing. If you go to China today, using the example of the two countries I said before, if you go to China today, 92% of the companies are MSMEs. 92%. They produce or contribute 60% of their GDP. China GDP is 13 trillion, 60% is 7.8 trillion, which is 20, 20 times Nigerian GDP. That's what this sector is contributing. They contribute over 60% of the entire industrial output, and they contribute in terms of jobs, they're employing over 70% of Chinese people. 800 million people are employed in China. 70% is 560 million. 
That is what MSMEs are doing in China. And government is aggressively supporting this sector. If you go there, you will see that overall, I will show you the disparity when I, I finish telling you what is happening with them and what is happening here. China today is determined to create 10 million jobs annually from 2015 to 2020. In fact, in 2018, by the first six months, they've created 7.2 million, which is over 40% of their target. And that's what they're doing. China has unemployment rate of 3.7%. If you go to Indonesia, which is the fastest growing in the mint nation, it is a similar situation. 97% of the companies in Indonesia are MSMEs. And they are creating over 90% of the jobs. Indonesia, they are producing 60%, over, again, over 60% of the GDP. The GDP of Indonesia is 1.2 trillion, 60% is 7.23 is one is 720 billion which actually is twice our gdp they have a population as you know of 260 million 145 million are employed msme is producing 90 percent of that which is 125 million so you could see easily what these people are doing in other nations and this can be done. It's not a rocket science. What are they doing? The government have a ministry of small, medium enterprise, enterprises and are supporting them. People ask you here, where are you going to get the money? How are you going to fund it, Peter? How are you going to support them? I was a businessman in the United Kingdom. Not my country, not to have anything to do with it. I came out of school, started business. My county supported me by giving me grants. The government gave me grants. In America today, in China, everywhere, government is giving people grants, support, and everything. So people say, what do we need? I said, you need aggressively support this sector to unleash what they can do in Nigeria. How do you do it? People say, oh, there's no money. We have borrowed a total of 28 trillion naira, 90 billion dollars. If we had devoted a quarter of that, 7 trillion, 23 billion dollars, to supporting that DNA Professor Kupta mentioned. Before I go into that, let me give you an example of what, what I experienced when I, the recent conference I attended, Tony Elumelu Foundation. The CEO of that foundation, Mr. Ife Gochuku, said that for every, for every entrepreneur they supported with $5,000, he created 20 jobs after one year. Speakers after speaker came and supported that position. Now, if we had taken away 25% of this money, $23 billion, and decide to support our entrepreneurs with grants, we would have given it to 4 million 600 entrepreneurs, assuming only 75% of them, which is 3 million, 300, 3 million 450, had created just 50% of the job, Ms. Ife Ima has said, instead of 20, they created 10, they would have created 34 million 500 jobs. If we had 34, million 500 people employed today, we won't be talking about 98 people living under poverty. 
It is very simple. It's not a rocket science. We would have been able to deal with this and all that. What you hear today in Nigeria is that, oh, revenue to GDP is low. Where are you going to get it? Are you going to tax people who are unemployed or businesses that are collapsing? If you want more revenue, everybody knows how you can get more revenue. Reboot your economy. Support those who are living in extreme poverty to come over this side and you get revenue. It's a simple. We have today taxable adults of 20 million. When it should be more. If you want more, you just support them. Eligible workforce in Nigeria is 150 million. Those who are employed are just about 75 million. So you have 40 million people that are not doing anything. Support them. So stop talking about revenue to GDP. Let's talk about how do you now get these people on this side? If the more China put people out of poverty, the more revenue they received. To show you how bad it is and what the China is doing, if you go to our banks today, the total credit of all the banks, loans they've given out, is 15.5 trillion. Out of that, 4,000 companies or thereabout have taken 13.3, call it about 3.3 billion each. The entire SMEs, MSMEs, 35 million, the entire loan to them is 500 billion naira, which is about 3% of 15,000 each. So they cannot contribute what their counterparts in China is contributing. In China, out of overall 30 trillion debts, MSMEs control 25% of it, which is 7.5 trillion. The consequence is that if you look at their tax revenue, if you look at their tax revenue, they do not just control, produce 60% of GDP or 70% of unemployment, they also contribute 50% of the tax revenue. China funds its budget from tax revenue. 80% of the, their budget is funded by tax revenue. 80% is about 3 trillion. And MSME provides 50% of it, which is 1.5 trillion. In Nigeria, the opposite is the case. Because these people are just living from hand to mouth. This year alone, about 10 million, half of this year, 10 million accounts become, became not operational again in Nigeria. Because you know why? People only lose open account now to beg for money. So once you, if it is shown that Nigerians withdraw money paid into the account faster than any other country in the world, because these people are just, uh, once they beg, once they beg you for money, you pay it in, by the time the money comes, it's already being withdrawn because that is what it meant for to go and eat. And that is the crisis we face. So people tell you, oh, we want tax to GDP or this. If you want that, the more you put people out of poverty, the more revenue you get. That's it's a very simple thing. It's like a bank account. You cannot continue to withdraw without paying anything in. No, you have to. And that comes to what Bismarck salute everybody saying that the government needs to come and decide that this is where we're going to go. In conclusion, I want you to show me something. There's some an advertisement from CNN I want us to listen to. That's where I'll just conclude. I want you to listen to this advert. Excuse me, miss, you dropped this. It's just a penny. Just a penny? Just a penny? It all begins with the humble penny. Whether writing your first check or cashing big checks, 
to those at the top, making their mark, closing deals round the clock. On Questmin's business, we know every penny has power. And it's not how many you have. It's what you do with them that counts. That's the marvel of money. Questmin's business. What a profitable hour. There's something you said here. It's not how much you have. It's what you do with it that counts. Nigeria think they will just win lottery one day. Or like, I'm sorry we're in a church, that we'll pray one day and God will solve the problem. He was going to solve it. I told Pastor Pochu that I went home with us and I told my uncle, I said, I finished praying and said, through Jesus Christ, your son. My uncle told me that he has passed the son, that he needs to see the father. where we are. That's where we found ourselves. Today what you hear is revenue to GDP. Can we talk about cost of governance to GDP? That is the problem. You cannot continue. Prophet Saluda has just told you how a, a governor, the wife had to work for them to be able to buy Car. Rafa, oh, Rafa, yeah, sorry. Rafa, yeah. You could see it. That is the situation everywhere. The cost of governance in Nigeria is unacceptable. It's the most expensive anywhere in the world. Just to use another example from the same America to show you, the, the Nebraska. It's not one of the big states in America. Nebraska budget this year is $12 billion. At 305, it's $3,660 trillion, trillion, naira. Nebraska is the only state in America where you have what you can call a single legislation. They don't have Senate and this is the only state in America. Nebraska have 49 legislators. They are paid $12,000 each. They are part time. $12,000 each. Nobody buys them a car, nobody buys them anything. Nebraska budget, I've told you what it is. So they buy 600 million the 600,000 600, is the entire thing they pay to their house, a salary and everything, which you use 305 is 183 million naira. Nebraska budget is, is about three times the actual expended budget of the entire Southeast and Northeast. If you put these 11 states together, they are not up to 1.2 trillion and Nebraska. So Nebraska is three times that. These 11 states have over 270 something house members costing over 16 billion annually for what they are doing for 183 million naira. That is the cost of our, the cost can go on and on. People tell us of stories. In France, the number three person had just re resigned. All of you have read it and everything. Why? Because him and his wife was found in a restaurant on a Valentine's Day while he was speaker before he became minister, drinking champagne and eating lobster. Imagine in Nigeria, the first would have joined him. This is in France where they make champagne. Oh. Where they make the champagne. And on the first day, Valentine's Day, so the man said, okay, let me just hear. Everybody would have joined the man for the best champagne. So we, let's talk about cost of governance. I can, I, I can tell you, having a president, 
as the governor. Nobody can tell me that our penny cannot do more than what it's doing today. I listen to where you have somebody who is owing a demon salary. He says he's owing only 12 and he wants to go again. And people, and people are giving him an award. I watch it in TV. They said, you're owing 18 months salary. He said, no. It's just about 11, 12. And he wants to go again. <laughs> and nobody's worried. I saw one recently who said, oh, he's not owing, only, he's not owing any, any salary. It's only owing pension and gratuity. You saw it. That's only only pension and gratuity. It's not owing salary. And he's saying that he's the best governor. And the lists are there. We are debating whether we'll buy this type of car. We're going to buy this type of house. Or like Soludo said, this appointment is this and everything. My dear people, like Soludo has said and this man has said, the world today is like, is on a, I would say it's on a fast lane. But the competition dynamics have changed. It's either you change or you die. It's that simple. You cannot continue to think you can compete today in a Formula One with a more low driver. <laughs> All of you end up in a lagoon. It's as simple as ABC. So we must change the narratives from bottom to up. It is critical. You can change this economy. You can do anything with it. But my dear people, we have no other country except this one. And we must do something about this or it will consume all of us. Thank you and God bless you.